Mm-hmm. Thanks, Chris. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm your host, Mary Fran Johnson, CEO of Mary Fran Johnson Media and a contributing columnist on CIO.com. Twice a month, we produce this video show and podcast streaming live to you on LinkedIn and onto IDG's Tech Talk channel on YouTube. Today's episode is sponsored by Cisco, the worldwide leader in technology that powers the internet. Cisco is out there inspiring new possibilities by reimagining your applications, securing your data, transforming your infrastructure, and empowering your teams for the future. Learn more about what they're up to at newsroom.cisco.com. We welcome all of our viewers today to join in this conversation with questions of your own. We'll be watching for those. Our social media editor, Michelle Davidson, will be keeping an eye on the feed and will be doing her best to pass your questions along to my guest today. And I'm very pleased to be welcoming John Marconti, who is the global CIO and a managing director at Vanguard. As a member of Vanguard's senior executive team, John reports directly to the Vanguard chairman, Tim Buckley, and he oversees all aspects of worldwide technology. Vanguard, you may have heard of, it is one of the world's largest investment management companies with more than $7 trillion in assets under its care at 19 locations worldwide. The company is out there serving a client base of roughly 30 million globally. And that includes individuals like you and me and institutional investors and financial advisors and global investors. As a 28 year veteran of Vanguard, John started out in the technology organization, but then started moving around in executive roles through many of Vanguard's businesses, including its high net worth business, asset management and financial advice. And then he came back to technology in 2012 as the global CIO. John serves as a member of Vanguard's innovation board and was a founding member of its innovation studio. Among his numerous honors and accolades over a very distinguished career, John has recently been awarded Philadelphia CIO of the Year for 2020. He also writes occasionally and blogs for the Enterprisers Project, which is an online community focused on CIO and leadership topics. And one of the things that we're gonna talk about today was the subject of his latest piece just a few weeks ago on how to help your organization think like a startup. John, welcome. It's so great to have you here. Well, thank you, Mary Fran. It's an honor to be here with you. And you know this CIO community loves you. So for many, oh, many years, wow. it's great to reconnect with you, too. Well, good. It's such a mutual admiration society. I, I can't even tell you. Let's let's launch into this discussion. Kind of, I love to I love to head up into the clouds to that thirty thousand foot view and talk about, but very specifically about the way business and technology have been so deeply integrated, not only during your career at Vanguard, but actually throughout the organization itself. Uh, tell us. Let's start out talking about that. Yeah, it's a it's a topic I'm really passionate about, and I, I think today more than ever, you know, I, I've had a long career, and you you embarrass me by going through most of that, but mm -hmm. uh, a long career, and I think we remember the times where technology, you know, was used a lot for efficiency and cost and productivity and all those things, and it's still still the number one, you know, uh, provider for those types of services, but you know today. Today, technology and, and corporate strategy are really interwoven. They're the same. I mean, yes. technology is the disruptor of, of our time. And, you know, mm -hmm. technology leaders have to be passionate about the business and business leaders have to be passionate about technology and understand what technology can enable. And uh, so, you know, for years, you, you had boards and senior teams not really talking API, the API economy, cloud, microservices. That's just not true today, which is which is incredible. So um, I, I would I would say now just turning this to Vanguard, like why, like what what matters, what makes um, what makes that connection for business leaders really to be passionate about technology and technology leaders really to be passionate about the business. What makes it is there's a shared level of accountability. Uh, today, because it okay. is about corporate 
strategy. And, and I've been in many sessions that, you know, there's only a few of us that uh, work for the chairman, but the reality is many sessions around Vanguard where, you know, one of my peers will sacrifice capital mm -hmm. or talent, their best talent to actually go from their business to an enterprise initiative or to another business. Yeah. And I, I would say that a couple secrets to that. One is, you know, if you want to encourage that, uh, Tim has us write, Tim Buckley, our chairman has us write our enterprise goals together. So we as a team actually carve enterprise goals. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the second thing, or maybe the last thing I'll say, because I can talk forever, Mary Fran, you know me well. The last <laughs> thing I say is, Vanguard comes, we're a very uh, rotational culture. You went through my experience. And I have to say that I wouldn't have planned my career that way. I don't know who taps the the geek, uh, tech geek on the shoulders and say, go run businesses with PL and then, you know, come back. But uh, it's been a massive rotational culture at Vanguard. And that, that, that plays into being able to turn your business hat or mm -hmm. your, you know, your myopic hat on your business or, or your work to yeah. what's good for clients, what's good for the organization at large. Well, and it, it's great, too, because I know over the years we've talked about this a lot, that it's one thing to talk about business strategy and technology being all aligned together and, and operating jointly, but it's a whole other thing to actually embed it in the culture. And that, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen without kind of everybody on that same team. For sure. So the let me see, I wanted to I really enjoyed the piece that you wrote um, a few weeks ago for the Enterprisers Project, and it, it was how to help your organization think like a startup. So uh, you had a couple of takeaways you mentioned there about embracing that startup mentality and corporate strategy. Let's talk about a few of those to begin with. Um, why is an organization as large and successful as Vanguard concerned about still keeping a startup mentality. Tell me kind of from your perspective why that's been so important. Yeah, yeah. And I'll take you through maybe our journey a bit. You know, um, I, I think, Bill, so so Tim Buckley, we, we talked about the rotational uh, nature of Vanguard. Tim, at one point in his career, was the chief information officer. So our chairman was the chief information officer, the chief investment officer and the head of retail all prior to becoming the, the chairman. But I remember a time where Bill McNabb was our chairman. I was reporting to Bill and so was Tim Buckley as the chief investment officer. And Bill, Bill, I don't know, man, this must have been almost a decade ago, ended up taking us all, you know, off site. We'd go off site and, and one memorable moment, we went out to the West Coast. We spent time with venture capitalists. We spent time with startups. Mm -hmm. You know, we spent time with people in tech, leading tech companies. And one of the things, you know, back then that we were enamored with, which was how people worked and the speed by which they, they were getting things done. So yeah. just those two things, how they were working and the speed by which they, they got things done. So we, we, we came back after that and we were convinced that we needed to adopt and really go through what we now call all of us in the industry digital transformation we needed mm -hmm. to adopt agile we needed to adopt cloud computing we needed to empower and not just the technical pieces we needed to empower cross-functional teams we needed to move from product or from project orientation to product and journey orientation right. and then that kind of accelerated for us when we implemented lean in our largest retail operations group, which we had this tremendous impact on productivity. But I think more importantly, more important than productivity, we had a huge impact, both the agile and lean movement at Vanguard early on, on employee engagement, how engaged people right. were. In that. Yeah. So today, that's an agenda across the company. It's something we call new ways of working. And if you went anywhere today, I, if you went to marketing, marketing is now, you know, organized in agile pods and focused on outcomes. Right. Well, and, and I know that those terms have been used so often in, in our industry is when, and I often heard lean referred to in a manufacturing sense. When you think about lean and the way it works at Vanguard, uh, what is, is there something significantly different about that in a financial services arena? I, I don't, I don't think so. You know, it, it is a, uh, 
you know, what, so what did all these terms encompass? Like, I, you know, I, I try to keep things simple when I'm talking to people, when they ask me questions about agile, lean, digital transformation, Yeah. you know, it is a change. So anything worth changing in life has, of course, the old adage of people, process and technology. Yeah. And if you started, if you just start with it, in order for teams to move fast and experiment and learn, you have to focus on first the technology piece. Like you can't tell someone to be fast and agile and put a cross-functional team together and tell them to go do things when you are doing monthly or quarterly releases of software to clients. Right, right. You have to be able to be nimble and, and quick. So, so first, technology. The second piece to any definition like this, digital transformation, agile, lean, is mm -hmm. the way you cross-functional, empowered teams, outcome-oriented teams which means that they have the same uh they have the same objectives and goals mm -hmm. that's different for it remember we grew up in the cost time meaning schedule go roi through. of the project yeah oh yeah, yeah yeah and the reality is that's not what you want a team to be focused on you want a team to be focused on cycle time or increased revenue or sales lead you know things yeah. that really matter and you want them to to move fast and then and then the people aspect of this is just moving the organization then from, you know, to pr true product ownership or journey ownership, end to end, looking yes. at your product is from the lens of the client. And, and the last thing I'll say is like, that sounds really simple. It's not, <laughs> not no. simple. It takes time. It's, and, and you've got to be willing to attack the system. Yes. So what I mean by that is like, boy, there's a lot of friction points to these things. It's mm -hmm. finance. You can't be so you can do all this, and then mm -hmm. your budgeting system is broken, and you you're not budgeting in a way that that enables you to be in, or enables you to be agile or legal or compliance or HR is about sometimes your processes are rewarding individuals versus teams. So yeah. there's a lot to think about, but it's a it's a journey. So that's how I would describe what we would call digital transformation in the industry. Okay. Well, and I, I remember when we were getting ready for this interview and talking about this, I had my own aha moment there where you started talking about the importance of setting up your agile infrastructure first and then addressing the culture piece. And what you've seen a lot of your comrades and colleagues in the CIO space doing is kind of the reverse, where it starts with a big talk up and everybody starts doing the culture piece of it. And then they start trying to fix those processes that are not lined up. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. I had a, a friend of mine who uh, came. Uh, he also leads technology at a company. He was fairly new at the company, and he was um, he was challenged to implement agile. And um, so he said, "Listen, like I, I want to talk to you. We here's our thought. Here's how we're approaching. You know, we believe in the cross functional mm -hmm. thing." You know, there's a couple of lessons learned that, that we've made. I, I would say mistakes we've made that yeah. I, I could share. The first mistake was, um, yeah, or at least lesson was, yeah, um, you have to build the agile infrastructure. The technology has to be there. And only you only really have to ask one question. And the question mm -hmm. is like, how hard is it to deploy software to real clients? Because if you can't deploy software quickly, Mm -hmm. to real clients can't enable those teams you know so we so we we talked about that we talked about implementing mm -hmm. pipelines mm -hmm. and you know automation cicd capabilities the second one is is even harder so if you had asked me what the hardest thing is and you you mentioned it mary fran before it's the cultural change it's yeah. like and and here I, I give credit because remember this isn't an IT thing this isn't a technology this is an enterprise movement for Vanguard and yeah. we started with training leaders that the role of the leader has to change so we went instead of new ways of working first we went to new ways of leading so the That's role of the leader becomes yeah. less autocratic and more focused and I, I think the the final thing for us was like remember it's an enterprise journey so you got to bring the whole enterprise with you. So. Yes. I, I told you well, talk. I'll, I'll shut up there, Mary Fran. <laughs> <Let you go. laughs> no, no, no. I, oh, come on, John. We could listen to you all day. 
<laughs> you know, and we got a whole hour. In fact, we have a question now from our alert yeah. and uh, listening and watching audience. And it's a good one. It's the financial services industry has been, I think, just in general, reluctant to embrace remote work in the past. In a post-pandemic world, how are firms differentiating themselves when most of their teams may be remote for you know an, an indeterminate amount of time going forward i'll bet you know usually i start out with that sort of pandemic era type question and we got we got off on another interesting track but i'm uh, i'm sure that's something that's very front and center and something you think about at vanguard so what would you say to that yeah no i, I listen i think um the world i'm, I'm going to talk the world and not financial services for for a second but the <laughs> world has woken up that um, you know, the, there's a lot of pain has come out of the pandemic, but the reality is, you know, there are a lot of integration of work and life and mm -hmm. community and self, you know, all of those things being important pieces. And over the last, you know, 15, 18 months, we have seen really good things. In fact, we, I think true for everyone, you, you started to see this tremendous productivity. If you looked at productivity just just in technology for a second, and you looked at how how often do you deploy software? That's one of our measures. You know, for how often do we deploy software to real clients, and you know that's a benefit. That's increased two hundred percent in the last two years at Vanguard. So wow. there is goodness. Now I think we have to wake up. There's goodness to working remote and people integrating their lives. At the same time. There is also goodness in being able to collaborate in person, yeah. and I think I think where uh, where leaders go wrong is they don't listen, and they make a decision to go down one path, and 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 they don't get the feedback. And I and I think mm -hmm. here what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what is the right balance yes. of giving people the, the future is more flexibility, but we still need the collaborative, you know. Yes. We, we still need to work as a team together. So I, I think also like how you treat people during the pandemic was really, really important. Mm -hmm. And we, um, I, there's a couple things that won't change. Uh, we blew through so many new HR processes. Um, <laughs> you know, um, unbelievable, unbelievable. So from setting up a crew relief fund for crew that were going in hardship, so that was new, a new fund. If your spouse lost your job, you could you can draw down on the crew relief fund, increased sick leave, caregiver leave, child leave for those children under 13. We need to we need to move at that pace. We need to continue to move at that pace and adopt the flexibility that we had in the pandemic and then figure out, you know, post pandemic, how can we mm -hmm. we create the collaborative environments we used to have too, because there's goodness there too. Yeah. Well, and of course, when you were, you were referring to crew, that's what you call employees or the people that work for Vanguard, more than 17,000 of them, right, around the world. And they are crew. I, uh, I, I find that very, uh, it's very interesting because I, it's the same way airline CIOs refer to the people that are flying their airplanes. Yeah, I have, everything's nautical at Vanguard. It comes from Jack Vogel, our founder. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, everything's nautical at Vanguard. So we mm -hmm. work out in ship shape. We eat in the galley, you know. <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> okay. Ways <laughs> to um, Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, circling back a little bit to that, um, you know, everybody's fascinated with, I think, huge corporate, big name, global companies that managed to infuse that startup feeling. And in that, in the article that you wrote, you you talked about uh, making sure tech leaders understand competitive position and strategy. That was, you know, that makes sense. The cross-functional agile teams we mentioned, but you also pointed out rebuilding key platforms with a green field approach. And from all my years at Computer World and then at CIO Magazine, Greenfield approach used to be what everybody tried to avoid uh, because it sounded so expensive. So talk about why that has become a much more viable strategy. Yeah, and I think this will tie into the other conversations that we've had. And, you know, what's what's interesting is I'm often on panels or calls with other CIOs and inevitably the conversation goes to, well, how do you get 
that how do you build the case? Mm-hmm. And, it, and you fill in the blank, Mary Fran. How do you build the case for AI? How do you build the case for cloud computing? Like how do how do you build the case? And um, I, I really do believe that the role of technology is to integrate and deliver the strategy of the company. The company has a mission and a strategy, and the technology's mission isn't any different other than it is the key enabler of that. So let's go back to, it's not about selling the case, because so often, just take cloud computing, for example. So often it's about, okay, well, is, is it about cost? Can I save money? You know, is it about five nine availability? Well, yeah, you can design five nine availability in the cloud. Is sure. it so? It's, maybe it's about resiliency. Maybe it's about um, deployments and productivity and how fast the technology teams can move. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, like that stuff, I think is the wrong way place to start. The place to start is in a greenfield opportunity. Can you build something that's really important to the business? And you can build it in a way that's cloud native and you can take advantage of all the things that come with cloud native technologies, but you're delivering on a key piece for the business. Let them feel it. And once they feel it, you don't need to make the case. The case gets accelerated for you because there's no business leader. There's no CEO. There's no CFO that doesn't want to be able to, you know, deliver some capability. We, we talked earlier about advice global mm-hmm. advice. And I can run through an example there, but the reality is no, no CFO, CA, CEO, CIO um, will give up the, or the benefit of actually seeing something live and seeing how fast you can react to clients and how fast you can make change and how much you can scale and how, how cheap it actually is to launch in a new market once you do it correctly. So uh. anyway, I would say start Greenfield do this on an important thing and yeah. the rest fall in place. You will you will get people asking you to refactor legacy environment. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Well, and so many CIOs are still saddled with, of course, I, I hear it referred to as technology debt. And yeah. it's just, and I'm sure, I'm sure that term makes everybody tighten up in the financial industry. Yeah. The, huh. um, uh, let me see. Uh, we've got another question from our audience, and it's about, and this I know is one of your favorite topics on inducing t- cultural change. And can you really, can you in- induce it by addressing leaders only, which I think you said you don't do that, but were there pilot agile units of people with the right mindset showing and paving a secure path for the rest of the folks to walk along? Yeah, I'm a I'm a firm believer of of two things. One, um, you 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 have to change the way you lead first, because leaders can't be autocratic. You know, we we talk about moving from you know perfection to progress. That's really important. Um, you know, from directing to serving. I think that's important because then you then you 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 have the ability to do the change management through the organization. But that's only the first step. You do, this is a ground, you know, a, a, a ground movement. Um, you know, we're talking about cross-functional teams that have the same objectives and those objectives are stated in business terms or outcomes at yeah. cycle time. And I'm also a, a firm believer having come, you know, long time developer uh, straight out of uh, high school into college, into GE, uh, mm-hmm. you know, at the time, uh, a firm believer, and then moving to the business, that when you go through a change, you should sandbox it. You yeah. should do exactly what this question is all about. You should set it up. You should watch it. You should mm-hmm. not let it out of a sandbox until it <laughs> actually is working. The worst thing you want to do is have some, you, you, worst thing you want to do is have something, so have an idea and then go big bang. The reality is Big yes. Bang doesn't work. You need to iterate your way. Mm-hmm. No CEO, CIO can say, we'll be agile in six months. And that's the way to approach this. That's top down. It doesn't work. What works is people actually believing it. And then let the people who go through the change tell the story. It's more powerful for someone who's gone through the change than me to tell the story. For them to say, this is what my world was like before this. Yeah. And this is what my world looks like now. 
Well, and you probably have some great stories about pleasant surprises that people discovered along the way, and then something that really didn't work, but you were able to kind of speedily deal with it. Um, you've got, you're such a great storyteller. Tell us one of those about, <laughs> especially about something that you tried and then you thought, oh, oh, this isn't working. Let's do something different. Well, this was the, uh, this was one of these. So I'll, I'll just go to one of the early pilots. So, okay. so we'll, we'll, we'll put it in our practice. Here's a real life example of one of the early, you know, agile pods. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's go time before this. Here's the goal you know, conversion rate, it's an important measure. You know, people are shopping today, whatever industry you're in, they're shopping, they're yep. looking at your company. Um, and, you know, a lot of them fall out of the funnel. Now, some, sometimes mm -hmm. you, you figure out why they fall, fall, but a lot of them fall out of the funnel. So one of the biggest things you can do as an organization is increase the conversion rate, that the, the bottom of the funnel actually gets wider. And that's one of the things that is, is huge. Um, and we had tried this, Mary Fran, I actually built online capabilities and mm -hmm. spent millions of dollars trying to solve these problems. So on the third try, on the third try, this was years ago, on the third try, yeah. it was like we just spent millions of dollars on these web capabilities, mobile capabilities, and the rate of conversion is not changing. Wow. So that was one of the first pilots for Agile and uh, yeah. lean. So we, we put a cross-functional team together. We said, listen, like we can't solve this problem. We spent millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the team's like, well, what's our budget? And it's like, listen, to increase the rate by like 4% or 2%, you know, it's an immense budget. That's an immense, over 30 million clients, an immense uh, yeah. benefit for the company. So you got what you need. We will fund you along the way. Mm -hmm. Go for it. And they started making all kinds of changes. Now they made process changes. They made uh -huh. technology changes. They made language changes. They made, so a lot of their changes incrementally moved the conversion rate where efforts before that, millions of dollars before that. By the way, people like me saying, uh, I think I have the answer to this. We need a new web capability. Right. We fit. We failed until the team actually could move quickly and pilot their way into it. And, and by the way, they made lots of mistakes too. They made a lot of changes that didn't matter. But the yeah. few that they made matter actually moved the conversion rate. Well, and that's always the thing about innovation. Everybody loves the word, you know, the I word. I, I'm always saying that when I put together agendas for our different events or CIO events, we would talk about business strategy, leadership and innovation. And those are kind of three no fail topics. Everybody loves to discuss them, but it's so hard to put your uh, to put your finger exactly on how you're going to get to innovation or innovating anything without some falling on your face and some things that don't work. And one of the, the, the greatest jewels when I could get it was someone to get on stage and talk through an example of something that didn't work and how they fixed it and then all the great things that came out of it. Um, it's just, we do, we call them, we used to, I think we did a cover story in CIO magazine years ago, you know, and it was about the F word, the F word being failure that mm -hmm. you know you know when it was when it was good to talk about failure and that's always been something i i think we're hearing more of that now i mean you just told us a very candid story about it and that is so helpful i think to uh, to your colleagues well i i do think you know it, you um i don't know how to say this right but i'll say it anyway you know you, you do have to have some level of humility as a leader you know uh, mm -hmm. jim collins writes collins is a, a you know He's he's a very important person at Vanguard. We we yes. got to spend some time with Jim Collins in my history, but um, you know he writes about this level five leader, and I love this. And arguably, Collins right. is the, the best researcher of our time. Um, you know, and he he goes through all these. You know, who are these phenomenal leaders? Like, there's a lot of good leaders, but what what differentiates phenomenal leaders from good leaders? Yeah. Um, and he goes through all of these. Oh, are they charismatic? Are they like, no, mm -hmm. one's charismatic, one's not. But they, but statistically, these companies, these leaders have out, outperformed. Like, why? 
why. He tries to tease it out, and I'll, I'll butcher it. So forgive me, Jim, for butchering this thing. <laughs> but a bunch of college, uh, forgive me. But the reality is, there's two competencies. Two okay. competencies. One is humility. And I think this speaks to if you're going to be successful as a leader in this new world, we just we just talked about, you know, pandemic and mm -hmm. and flexibility. Um, but but you talk about innovation and and, le and leading today. If you're going to be a good, you need to know you don't know everything. That the good part of this is about listening and uh, and, and and putting together teams and allowing the front lines to make the decisions that they're closest to and trusting people along the way. So that that's that's one. The second one, which I love, is grit. Ah. Because yes, you can you can knock off your horse many times. And I'm you know, if you're in IT and or you're a CIO or you're a developer, you know this yes. that we fail <laughs> a lot and we yeah. fall down a lot and we yeah. get back up and get back up and get back up. And because you have we to care about what we do. And yeah. you have to know how to fall correctly so you don't break your neck. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it's all about that. I've got, my my granddaughters are over in Ireland and they're all learning to ride horses. And every time I see, every time I see one of the videos where they're bad, they're little itty bitty girls and they're bouncing around on these enormous beasts. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm, I'm one of those warriors and I'm sort of like, oh my God, what are they going to do if they fall? And one of them did. One of them fell off and she said, I landed right on my chest, Nan, and I just got right back up and I was just so thankful. <laughs> So, um, right, right. It's, it's that focus, though. It's that yeah. passion. Like we, we talked about yes. innovation for a second, and uh, you know, where does innovation matter? It, you know, cross disciplines matter. What you know, why the cross? -discipline? That's where innovation generally occurs when when disciplines come together, right? So yeah. cross cross functional teams do matter. Diversity mm -hmm. matters. If anyone wants to try it's to debate whether that. diversity matters, it's, that's over. It, we know that diverse teams make better decisions. Yes. Uh, but Collins also talks, you know, often about it, the hedgehog concept, which is what can you be best at? Yeah. What are you passionate about? And then what drives your economic engine? If you look at the intersection of all three of those things, mm -hmm. that's where you focus on innovation. Don't try to be something you're not. Right. You know, do some industry that you're not passionate about. You know, Vanguard's passionate about serving individual investors at the end of the day. We are super passionate about yeah. serving people and we'll do that through other intermediaries and, and and we'll do that directly with a relationship um and then the last thing is like boy tie the outcomes that you have if you're thinking about innovation to what's important to the company like you know it's really important to get focused not to try to implement some technology for technology's sake it's it's really to meet a business need or to deliver some set of capabilities. Yeah. Well, we yeah. have another uh, fabulous yeah. question from our alert watching audience here, and I think you will love this one. Can you tell, oh, us, tell us about that one thing that you brought back from the business to technology? Because thankfully you came back. You came back as the global CIO <laughs> in 2012. We would have missed you at CIO Magazine and CIO.com if you hadn't. So you came back and what was the one thing that you brought back from the business? Yeah, I, uh, I've, it'll sound funny. Um, empathy. I brought back empathy. So um, <laughs> for the hard. business or empathy for everybody? Both. This is what's great about rotational yeah. you know, environments. I, like yeah. I, I had a, a, a long time passion and still do, of course, for technology. And I had come up the routes of technology for, mm -hmm. for a chunk of my career. And then going to run the business and the P&L and advice and, and even before that, you know, way back when Six Sigma for Vanguard. But the reality was like, boy, empathy that these things are complex. Um, and, you know, so to me, that's what I brought back. Now, rotation, you can bring a lot of things back. I, I'll tell you now that if you can can convince your organization yeah. um, around rotations, especially for technology individuals to get out of technology into the business or business individuals to get into technology. It gives you a broader view. Where, where else besides technology and corporate strategy actually? And in the business, do you get to see this broad view yeah. or global experience or 
meeting with clients face to face. You really want to get feedback? This is phenomenal. Go out and, and, and go on sales calls, go on prospect calls, go on client calls. Um, those things, those things matter. P and L, you know, management matters and, and good general management and operations matter. So I think the biggest thing that I, I took back, I took all those things back. Biggest thing I took back was an empathy and an ability to see, you know, both sides of the same coin. Yeah. Well, and I just so I've had so many interviews like that over the years where CIOs went out and the first thing they maybe they were a waste management business and they went out at five in the morning and drove around in the trucks and they could actually see, you know, what technology was working and what wasn't. And so it gave it's not I think it's even beyond empathy. I think it's connection, too. It's that 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 human reaching across the aisle saying, ah, we get that, you know, we get that you have that problem. Um, I, I was thinking, too, about the effect of the pandemic and some of the questions it settled for us. And I've had so many CIOs tell me that the idea that remote workers wouldn't be productive has been completely settled. But the question I think is still open is how much remote do we all want to live with? You know, the idea of coming back in a, I think hybrid work and more flexibility. I don't know if we're gonna pick, is any word is going to be the biggest word of all for the 2020s, it will probably be flexibility, right? Empathy and flexibility maybe. I 100% uh, I, I agree. Yeah, let us pivot now to the big enterprise advice the financial advice platform this this new i know i know you love this topic and i think all the people that are getting advice from vanguard these days love it too this is when we think about the big business and technology um, issues and things that you're solving going forward that advice platform is a very big and important new thing so tell us about that yeah and i think we can weave this into a couple you know, stories of like, hey, it's not about technology for technology's sake. And, right. you know, maybe maybe even the uh, Greenfield approach and, mm -hmm. you know, what we did. So um, I would say first, you know, part of part of technology is, of course, deliver the strategy of the company. So three or a little over three years ago, Tim Buckley and I, and Tim was in his chief investment role. I was in, of course, this role. Mm -hmm. um, we we had a chance to go pitch three charts to the board and we actually did the charts you know we did the charts we just drew them up on powerpoint they were nothing special there were three oh. charts that <laughs> three charts that basically talked about a goal of building a global advice platform where mm -hmm. vanguard could could enter new markets as nimbly as a startup we said even better than a startup so mm -hmm. that, that's interesting that was our that was our pitch um, and the board said, go, go for it. Bill McNabb was a huge um, our chairman at the time, a huge proponent of both technology and advice. Um, and over the last few years, we, we essentially did that. You know, um, we, we proved that tech, we, we, we use technology to enable that strategy. So today, today um, in new markets, think about it, in new markets, you can go into a new market for Vanguard or maybe a country you're launching, a direct advice market, financial advice market. Mm -hmm. And you can go in and build a startup team and that startup team can immediately hit the ground and get 85% reuse out of a global cloud native mm -hmm. platform for building the, in creating the building blocks for financial advice or for a website or for authentication or for data and analytics. Mm -hmm. All of those have been built out in a global platform. I'm Mary Fran, years ago, that wasn't possible. And, and think about it, the case for cloud native platforms at Vanguard was made because of it enabled strategy, not because of resiliency, efficiency, costs. Right. We built Greenfield approach to solving one of the best ways or one of the biggest initiatives, strategic initiatives we needed and wanted to have. Mm -hmm. So being able to launch in a country or being able to launch a new market is the power of, of technology and strategy being integrated. I think the second goal is today, technology built through APIs, microservices, cloud technology, it, it's extensible. And, and why is that important? It, it's important because um, it creates optionality for the future. You know, um, if we wanted to share components of that platform 
or string the components up into an application and share it externally. We could do that. Now, that's not a strategy that we're actually attacking at this moment, but yeah. it creates optionality for things we haven't even dreamed of yet. And I, and I, think, I think it's worth talking about, like, even that article for the enterprisers about startups mm -hmm. and global companies. We, this approach is differentiated. Startups don't hit the ground with 85% reusability. They don't hit the ground with a global company that's funded a global platform that you could reuse for uh, direct-to-consumer financial advice. Um, they don't start with a brand like Vanguard. They don't start with 30 million clients that you can listen to and learn from. They don't start with thousands of advisors who are giving advice today. Um, right. So arguably, arguably, we need to move at that pace, but leverage all of those capabilities yeah. of a large global company. And global companies, because of the legacy environments and their history, when global companies went, uh, you know, when they went global, when they went international, mm -hmm. they dropped seeds, they built data centers, they built capabilities, and they grew up independently often of, of the, uh, you know, of the global company. Yeah. yeah that's right. a different sure. approach. That, that, we, if we had to do this years ago, it wasn't possible. Technology, AI, ML, capabilities, cloud computing has allowed us to act like a startup, but to leverage the benefits of a global firm. Yeah. Well, and I know because I've, I've heard you say that often that you'd much rather be doing this global advice platform from the kind sure. of global position and, and agility you have now than just being at a startup. Um, the Let me see. I wanted to move next to um, talking about, uh, we've talked a bit about Agile and the lessons learned there and the mistakes you yep. see people making. Um, the that building an agile infrastructure is that are you seeing more of your colleagues approaching this in the same way or are, are you the only one having this idea or is this something that you're seeing <laughs> take, take hold with some of your other cio colleagues who talk to you about these things there, there's nothing innovative about my my uh, suggestions here <laughs> nothing innovative <laughs> there are all the technology exists i just it just a lot of times people get out ahead of themselves. So agile and lean and, you know, digital transformation often gets out ahead of it itself. You know, you, you've heard the stories of CIOs saying, okay, we're, we're going to be agile and I, I, we're going to be agile in six months. And really what that means is then the IT organization, our technology groups, they try, try to implement some best practices. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is they haven't integrated with the rest of the company uh, they certainly haven't changed their 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 budgeting processes or their HR processes, the morning teams, and it's a failure. Hmm. And it's a failure because you know you started with with something uh, that had an end date, and, it, and you're not living to those new ways of working principles. Mm -hmm. So lay out the objective and allow the organization to do it, and be there as a leader to clear the way. You know, yeah. so so often legal risk you know, compliance, they get, they get, uh, they, they, they get accused of being, you know, the no group. Blockade. Yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. But they're not, they're not, they're actually, they're, they're of course a protection group. <laughs> they need to protect yes. the company. The reality is we need to get them to be a yes and group. Yeah. Yes. And we need to do it this way. And in order right. to do that, getting th that, th those organizations involved in the change upfront matters. Mm -hmm. It matters. So that's what I mean by it's an enterprise approach. But yes, I, I think the agile infrastructure says your technology has to be ready to move fast. Yeah. You can't build on a foundation that's weak. Very yes, of course. Very good point. I know it sounds obvious, doesn't it? But then it sounds obvious, but but it doesn't. But most things in life are obvious. Talk. Yeah. Well, when you look, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So when you look behind, you're like, oh, okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, like Vanguard made a lot of these mistakes. <laughs> yeah. There you go, and and we're still standing, right? Um, now standing. I want to pivot now into talking about talent and talent acquisition strategies. But before we get there, we have a short, easy question from our audience. Are yes. there any must-read books that you suggest for oh. aspiring CIOs? I know you've dropped Jim Collins' name a few times. Um, oh, wow. I've heard I've heard other CIOs talk about Simon Sinek 
and oh, some, yeah. of, some of yeah. his books. So when if you think of any one or even two, I'll give you two, must read books for CIOs, because I know you're also a reader. So oh, yeah. what, would you, what would you guide people to? Well, I would, you know, so a couple things, you know, Simon Sinek, Start With the Why, like you, you, you mentioned mm-hmm. that phenomenal. Those are good books for sure. You want to read those. You know, if you're thinking more from a technology perspective, I think uh, ask your developers, <coughs> wow. excuse me, mm-hmm. ask your developers in a software mindset. It's about listening to consumers, rapid iter- iteration, feedback. I think it's written by Jeff Lawson. Okay. Uh, Carol DeWitt uh, wrote The Growth Mindset. We, we talked about grit. Uh, it's about yes. the love of learning and grit that you need to succeed. Mm-hmm. I think that's a huge, wonderful book. Working Backwards by Bill Carr, you know, keeping the end in mind from Amazon. Like that, those, th- those books are phenomenal. And if, if you're not a book reader, um, you know, I, I, if you ask me my iPod, you know, uh, mm-hmm. this is going to be like, you know, A16Z from Andreessen and Horowitz. I love that. I'm sorry, but I just, I do. I love those, 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 uh, those, those podcasts. Podcasts, uh, yes. Yeah, Dak Shepard, the armchair expert. That, that mm-hmm. they're all on my, so if you get, went through my book list and my iPod list, that's what. Yeah. My, yeah. Well, podcast. that's great. And I think listening to a book, I think in some ways you almost pay more attention than when you read, because I do both. I read them. I actually still get books out of the library. I've had so many, so many CIOs make fun of me over the years when they discover that. Uh, but I do, I get, I read library books. I read books on Kindle and I listen to a lot of different books um, as well. And I know that um, it, it's just, it's, you're absorbing information from all these different directions. So those are some, that, those are some great suggestions. I have been. Go ahead. What have you been? What have you been? I have been telling everybody to listen to Brene Brown's Dare to Lead podcast. It's because she gets in there interviewing all these different business book authors. It's this amazing way to not only find out what's in a wonderful business book, and there's a lot of human and emotional and and dealing with people issues, because that's, of course, her specialty. Uh, She's a social and emotions researcher, the original, the the person who made it okay to be vulnerable, you know, and um, she does a wonderful podcast and she interviews all these wonderful, and then I end up wanting to read the books themselves so but what were you well, gonna say no no i'm just gonna comment on Brene brown like it, huge followership at vanguard vulnerability we talked about um mm-hmm. humility uh, yeah. but yeah you you can't you can't even even with the way you manage teams you know five dysfunction of a uh, of a team years ago years ago by mm-hmm. uh, patrick Lazioni, you know mm-hmm. you can't you can't create trust without vulnerability. And I, she just, she has a huge followership here. Uh, couldn't agree more. Yeah, couldn't okay. Agree. All right, now let me pivot back to that talent question, because I know you and I have talked about this quite a bit, especially recently. And from past conversations, I know that you take advantage of everything, the university recruiting, you work with startups, uh, you're yep. very interested in diversity leaderships. Give us kind of the way how you're approaching it now and what sort of things you especially wish everybody was doing. Well, and I want to, I'm going to start cause I do think there's a lot here and, and it's a really mm-hmm. rich topic. But I, I want to start with like, cause you get asked a lot, like, well, how do you win the talent race? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'm going to go, th- I'll go through a bunch of things, you know, that Vanguard has done, uh, to get from recruiting, and then we'll maybe talk a little bit about retention and the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and walking mm-hmm. the talk and having action. Those things actually matter tremendously. But I will say, if you had a short elevator pitch, the way we win is because this company is a mission-based organization. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean that. I mean, today, everyone who's looking for a job especially uh, students coming out of universities mm-hmm. or high school, they, they want to do good. Like yeah. they, they want to do good. And, and, and if you have a passion for technology and a passion for investments, mm-hmm. then you want to go, you know, go to bed at night knowing that you're helping people. Like, like Vanguard's mission, very simple mission, give people the best chance of investment success the company is organized because it's not owned by, it's not public and it's not private. It's actually 
in the investment community unique to the sense that it's owned by its shareholders and its, or its, its investors. So you, Mary Fran, you own Vanguard. I do, which is wonderful. a small piece, but I do. <laughs> which, 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 you know, you do, you do, but you own Vanguard because you're you're an owner, and that drives everything. That drives mm -hmm. this client first mentality, and the company is a profit company, and all the profit goes through the company, and the, the larger Vanguard gets, the more scale. Mm -hmm. We then send the profits like a dividend back to our investors, and we lower the cost of investing. So we lower the cost of advice, we lower the cost of the funds, the ETFs, we lower the cost of investing for you. That's mm -hmm. the way the company is built. So we attract people who want to give back. And the way they want to give back is they're a CFA or they're an investment technology professional and they love investments um, or they're an AI engineer and they, they want to use AI to help people with debt management because the people mm -hmm. who need advice can't get advice because they're not the hunted in the industry. So mm -hmm. I would start like that purpose, mm -hmm. your purpose matters. Simon Sinek, start with a Y, by the way. We'll cover mm -hmm. that if you want to read the book. All right. So you want to talk about like how to attract talent and some of the things that we're uh, yeah. Well, especially especially these new ways to attract talent because you yeah. you do all the expected things, and because yeah. I, I know we had a conversation recently with uh, the organization I've started working with, the National Cyber Scholarship Foundation, and we ended up talking about um, all of the different ways we can get more diverse candidates in, interested even in technology. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And, and so I, I think one is, Hey, how do you, you know, from an attraction standpoint, you know, look for opportunities for us as an example, I did a video uh, with Christy Edling day who uh, runs our financial advisor and our institutional business. She's the CIO for those divisions. Um, we did a nice, uh, we did a nice video with handshake. Now Good. handshake is hard up. Uh, their mission, by the way, isn't like, hey, we want to give companies the best talent. Their mission is we want to give students the best opportunity, regardless of your zip code, regardless of your background, regardless of whether an employer comes to your campus or your campus is so small that employers mm -hmm. don't. How do we how do we give people that best chance yeah. to get started on a career? And I think that's mission aligned. You know, why, why Vanguard Handshake? That's the same mission. We have the same mission, give investors the best chance of investment success. Okay. So to me, try things like that. They have tremendous reach and they are finding mission aligned, uh, you know, individuals yes. uh, from all different aspects. Um, you talked about diversity. So you have to be at places. Grace Hopper is a huge event uh, for women in mm -hmm. technology. Huge event for us. Afrotech has twenty thousand members. You know, lesbians who tech. You know, like the, you have to be in those places and uh, telling your story, and and they matter. Mm -hmm. And then I guess one of the things I would say too is community matters. Look for the win wins. You know, how can you do good in the community and at the same time, you know, advance your attraction, advance your diversity. A trans, you know, advance your, your technology as a company. How can you do that? What's the win-win? And there are organizations like Step It Up America. It's run by UST and focuses on underrepresented communities. Sometimes, a lot of times, women in underrepresented communities and reskilling them for tech. Mm -hmm. um, Launch Code. I happen to be on the board of the Philadelphia chapter of Launch Code. They just launched in Philly. Nonprofit. It's free technical education and job readiness training. For, for individuals. Yeah. Uh, P Tech focuses on areas where high school graduation is an issue. Yes. So it's a six year program. It's a four years of high school and two years mm -hmm. essentially community college, you know, focused on technology. So now we're at the high school level. Code differently is at elementary school code camps. And then even Autocon, uh, where you have technical consultants who are somewhere on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. Those things are win wins. They are win-win yeah. because you get the best talent and they're eager to, to help. They're mission aligned mm -hmm. and you're, you're changing our communities.
Well, and we're finally bringing more, uh, a much broader diversity of thought into all of these conversations. And it just, oh. it, it makes such a difference. And it's, um, I, I think it's wonderful that you do that. I keep being surprised by how you, uh, the, the misconceptions there are about like technology and even cybersecurity careers, that you need to have a master's degree from a huge university to get the interest of corporate, you know, big companies well known around the world like Vanguard. And that is just the opposite is true, isn't it? There's just a whole yeah. range. Yeah. The um, let us let me see, I will check and see if we have any more questions from our very alert audience before I get to ask you my favorite follow up question, which is your Oh, good. It's your leadership advice. And I especially I want you to tell that story about you sitting down with Jack Bogle when he was promoting you. So, so well, no, anyway. it, was actually, it was actually Jack Brennan, Jack Brennan. Oh, so Brent, we, Jack. Van, Vanguard's only had four, Jack, Vanguard's has four uh, chairmen. Jack Bogle yep. was the founder, Jack Brennan, Bill McNabb, and now Tim Buckley. Okay. So I, I know the story you're, you're talking about though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I'll try to, and I'll try to be quick because I'm thinking we only have a few minutes right now. Yep. So, uh, uh, somewhere along your career, you're asked to do something that you think you are wildly unprepared for, or may not be in the perfect direction that you thought. And I, I'll give you this example, and it sounds really simple, but I learned from this example to take a leap of faith and to go to do things even in the businesses. So uh, this was uh, a few months before 9-11, uh, Bob DiStefano, who's arguably Vanguard's uh, greatest chief information officer mm -hmm. passed away. When Bob passed away, I want to say he was in his early fifties from unexpectedly from a heart attack. We were all then reporting to the chairman, mm -hmm. uh, Jack Brennan. I was in my destination job. I was running a group of, it was institutional technology and wow. it was fun because the large, large technology group doing some great things, but you'd go meet with clients, uh, mm -hmm. on, on the technology and the salespeople would actually, if you could talk like I can, you could yeah. actually, You're salespeople would, yeah. they would take you to, that it would take you to prospecting meetings and stuff yeah. like that. So it was, it was my destination job. I loved it. You're and, um, so much fun. I, <laughs> I was having fun. And, yeah. and Jeff Brent, I think it was like, Hey, call me and say, Hey, can you be here like seven in the morning? And I have mm -hmm. some news for you. And I knew what the news was. I mean, I've never confessed this. So please everyone keep this a secret. <laughs> uh, I knew what the I knew what the news was. I thought hey, we were going to get a new chair. Of course, we're not all going to report to the chair. We're going to get a new global CIO, okay. and that global CIO was going to be my peer at the time, Tim Buckley, who's now my chairman. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of funny stories to this. Mm -hmm. So I went home. I practiced in the mirror. I'm like, okay, Jack's going to tell me I have a new uh, boss. It's Tim Buckley, and I started saying, okay, Jack. Uh, Tim Buckley, he's great. Tim and I have been peers. I've seen what he's been doing early on in the web. It's incredible. He's going to be, he's a great leader. I'm really excited. Thank you for the three months reporting to you. I learned a ton and thank you for telling me. Mm -hmm. So I, I go down with Jack Brennan and we're sitting at a stable in, in his office real early in the morning. He says, Hey, look, I have some news. Um, you're going to get a, a new boss. It's going to be Tim Buckley. I'm like, Jack, Tim Buckley. Fabulous guy. I saw what he's doing on the web. Love Tim. He's going to be great in this job. You know, I really appreciate you telling me, uh, you know, in person. And by the way, Jack, I learned so much from you over the three months, the last three months. And I started to get up and he's like, I oh, know, sit down. I'm not done. And you're getting a new job. And he told me this is now after 9-11 financial services. You're going from application development to run infrastructure up here. And I fell apart. I'm like, Jack. I know. <laughs> Please, God, I won't no. Say, I won't say the word. I said, crap. But it's not exactly yeah, what I said. Yeah. Jack, I know crap about <laughs> infrastructure. This yeah. is the wrong guy. I'm the wrong guy. <laughs> and I started lecturing the chairman about the difference between infrastructure, hardware, and software, and why I was the wrong person. I'm like, and finally, Jack just says, he's like, listen, it's the largest budget. You're the right guy. You'll go and learn. Yeah. You know, you'll go and learn. It's a really important time, too. I, I, we have to understand you know, disaster recovery. And John, this is, we're having faith in you. And right there, I thought, oh, what a lesson. What a lesson. I had prepared for one conversation, but I fell apart in the other. 
it's about taking a leap of faith. I learned a ton over the next three and a half years about building data centers and infrastructure. Yes. And, you know, and the reality, it just trained me to take the leaps that I did to the business and, and back yeah. to IT. So it was a great lesson by, by Jack Brennan. I love, well, and I love that idea that at some point he had to lean over to you and say, if I needed your opinion about oh. this, I would have asked you. I left that part. I think I left that part out. Like he did. He was like, if I wanted your opinion, I would have asked. Jack won't remember this. But I remember those words because I thought, oh my God, I screwed this up. So anyway. Oh no. He said, oh, I just sna snatched, what is that? That's snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. You didn't. <laughs> You didn't see it as a victory. You thought, oh, no, I'm in my dream job. Leave me alone. And then but, and again, the power, the power of someone having faith in you and giving you opportunity yeah. well, well beyond your capabilities, probably. But Yes. Awesome. Well, I think you reflect that in everything that you do. And as always, it's been an absolute delight having you here today. Thank you so much for doing this on a on a Wednesday afternoon in the middle of July. We were so lucky to get you. And thank you so much for being a, a guest here on CIO Leadership Live with us. My pleasure, Mary Fran. And always great to reconnect. It really is. Now, if you joined us late today, you can watch the full episode later today right here on LinkedIn, but also on CIO.com and YouTube's IDG Tech Talk channel. Leadership Live is also available as an audio podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with John Marconti, the global CIO for Vanguard, even half as much as I did. Leadership Live is going to be taking a break for the rest of the summer, so we'll off for the month of August. I think we're trying to pretend we all live in Europe. But we will be back in September with some more inspiring conversations with a great lineup of chief information and digital officers. Thanks again to our friends at Cisco for sponsoring today's episode, and do take a moment to subscribe to us on that YouTube channel, IDG Tech Talk, where you can actually find all of the previous shows, which is at this point more than 75 in-depth interviews with CIOs. I keep talking it up as something incredibly bingeable, so if you're looking for beach listening over the summer, then by all means join us. Stay well, and we'll see you again in September. Thanks so much.